Hello and welcome to a new episode of Another Angle. My name is Abby and I'm on a mission to help our listeners learn about ways on how to improve their health, their fitness and their overall well-being. We will be joined by guests and specialists from sectors like medicine, nutrition and fitness who will be bringing you the latest advice and the latest trends in what's happening in today's world. Thank you very much, Dr. Terry, for joining us. How would people describe you? Well, yeah, I'm certainly on the cutting edge in terms of my advocacy of creating health by teaching people how to improve uh, how their cells run the biochemistry of life. Uh, And because I've been on the cutting edge at various times, people have called me, you know, a quack uh, and and worse. But as our research has gained uh, credibility, now I'm uh, being called this brilliant uh, innovator Uh, and have uh, more and more recognition here in the States and uh, around the country and around the world. Um, But, you know, it can be a challenge being on the the cutting edge. The place where you're at today has been the result of the previous experience that you had since you were diagnosed in 2007 or 8? Or has it always been the case for you since since a young age? So, yeah, I'm a, a professor of medicine here at the University of Iowa, and I certainly had a very conventional approach to treating disease, thinking that you no, know, you you make a uh, diagnosis quickly, get people on the best drugs, uh, the best technology, and you know that worked reasonably well. Uh, but then once I was diagnosed with a neurological disease, uh, multiple sclerosis, and experienced relentless decline, uh, despite seeing the best people in the country taking the newest drugs, that led me uh, down this very interesting path of deciding out. Well, it's up to me. I have to read. Uh, do all that I can. And I began reading the basic science, you know, uh, experimenting based on what I was learning using uh, supplements, diet, uh, and then redesigning my uh, diet and lifestyle in a very specific way. And of course, that was not to get better because I knew with progressive MS, you, you do not get better, that this is uh, one way uh, that one's functions are lost, they're gone forever. Um, so I was uh, quite surprised when my decline stopped. And even more surprised when I started getting steadily stronger. I, and uh, when uh, in a year I went from being unable to sit up to being able to bike 18.5 miles. So uh, it was a, quite a breathtaking year, actually. I can imagine. I can only imagine. And uh, I, I think you mentioned something that just brought me back to one sentence very much used in my language. And it says, the power or the strength is in the bite or in the food that you actually have in your in your system. So that's basically yes. something that is known, it's been said for centuries and ages, and a lot of people actually keep saying them every now and then. But for some reason, as you may have mentioned in your TED Talk, we just keep failing that. We were so swept up with the power of antibiotics to take people who were on the cusp of dying uh, 100 years ago. Uh, young individuals who developed an infection, rapidly going downhill, about to die from uh, their infection. We give them antibiotics, and suddenly we reverse the infections, and we see these dramatic healing stories. So physicians got caught up in the power of drugs. Uh, The public got caught up in the power of drugs. We thought they would save everything. Uh, And what we failed to see was that we'd had this uh, rapidly emerging epidemic of mismatched diseases because our environment, what we've been eating, doing, how we live uh, every day is so far divorced from what our DNA expects us to be doing that we are not running the chemistry of life properly in ourselves. And that leads to dysfunction, leads to symptoms, leads to disease states that we keep thinking that these magic drugs will fix. Uh, but of course, because we aren't getting to the root cause of what, of what caused that mismatch, people continue to decline despite getting uh, ever more potent and powerful drugs. As you may well know, there is quite a huge influence for media on how they present the power of these uh, new new drugs and their impact on our health and how, how well they are for us. Oh, yeah. So I think nowadays, as we actually move into this new era of uh, uncovering the role of our genes towards our susceptibility to disease and trying to find that common ground between matching our genetics with our environment or what's really best suited for us, 
And I, I think that's something that is quite evident nowadays with COVID-19. As you may well know, there's a lot of research around around the fact that our genetic variations have a direct uh, impact on whether or not we would be uh, susceptible to have the disease. Well, it's really a marriage between the genes that make me a little bit more vulnerable, but there's a much more dramatic impact of my accumulated life choices. Do I have hidden inflammation because I, I have insulin resistance, because I have a very high carb diet with lots of sugar uh, and uh, foods that dump a lot of sugar into my bloodstream? You know, am I a smoker? Uh, am I living where there's a high level of air pollution, in particular matter, uh, in the air? Do I have terrible sleep disruption? So there's all these factors that contribute to this hidden level of inflammation and these inflammatory cytokines, plus some element of genetic vulnerability. But it's my perception as I'm reading the literature, COVID-19 has really unmasked is how divergent our lives are from what our DNA expects. That this epidemic of a terrible lifestyle leading to terrible physiology and terrible biochemistry can't handle stress and can't handle the stress of these infections. Whereas if you are um, you know, eating a great diet, meditating, uh, exercising, uh, sleeping well, having meaningful uh, relationships, so social connections, you'll be much more likely to have mild disease. Absolutely. Much more likely. Absolutely. But I think this is something that have been well explained over years and centuries over time. I think it's not a, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's not a secret that humanity throughout its existence have known the importance of having a good diet, having enough sleep, having exercise as, as measures to, to maintain good health. However, we always kept failing that. You know, yeah, I'm, I'm going to challenge you on that a bit. The, the traditional physicians, you know, in the uh, Chinese uh, medicine routine, Ayurvedic routine, uh, even in Western medicine, for a long time, we focused on diet, lifestyle, fresh air, love, uh, and it was a fairly consistent message across most healing disciplines. But it really was when we discovered ant uh, antibiotics and we, uh, with Cox postulates, we discovered uh, bacteria, uh, and we began to understand the, uh, um, some of the uh, molecular base, well, some of the pathophysiology and went down the drug path and thought we had these shortcuts. And we got distracted from our roots. And the public got wowed by these miraculous cures. So, you know, it's, it's not, I, actually I'm forgiving of all of that because we are impressed with shortcuts. We're all looking for shortcuts. And now we're having to come to terms with the fact that the shortcuts doesn't really work out very well. We still have to take care of uh, our nutrition, are uh, all of those uh, lifestyle factors. It may be attractive to think that you could do a shortcut, but if you abandon those basics, that shortcut will not lead to health. Absolutely. I just want to have your opinion on this. Do you think if that knowledge was not available in the early 20th century during the Spanish flu, don't you think that the humanity would have been wiped out from that virus? Not at all. There's no reason to think that. And here's why, why I have that opinion. Since recorded history, humanity has been facing epidemics. And, and you really, since we've had the biological life forms, the single cellular organisms and the multicellular organisms, there has been this biological warfare where with random mutations, the single cellular organisms become more effective in their ability to infect the multicellular organisms and kill more of us off. And then we have those who have the better genetics, the better environment, uh, they survive, have better reproductive success. And so there's this continual evolutionary arms race between the infecting microbes and their target, which is us. And since recorded history, humanity has been facing epidemic after epidemic after epidemic. That's why biology is really a sine wave of the ebb and flow of populations. When a uh, population is stressed, the vulnerable from genetically and who have, have had poor nutrition um, will die off. And those who are superior genetically and have had better nutrition will have greater reproductive and survive. So we've had other viral epidemics. We've had other bacterial epidemics that have wiped out a third of humanity, and we've always rebounded. So whatever we figure out with COVID-19, I assure you there will be another epidemic. 
and there'll be another pandemic and another pandemic. And that's just the nature of biology because of the random mutations. There, there will be another organism that escapes and has increased virulence and will kill us off more effectively. And then those who survive because they've done a better job of self-care and they have a, a slightly better, slightly different genetics will have greater reproductive success. That's been going on for, you know, for a billion and a half years and hopefully it'll go on for several billion more. I just would like to know your opinion about this. As this pandemic have hit us at a time in, in the history of, of the universe or of the planet where we have something called medical technologies. Mm -hmm. And as someone who is at the cusp and the edge of this of this new new field, do you think it is ethical for governments or public health authorities moving forward to start genetically uh, screening people in order to protect the ones that are more vulnerable? Or do you think it should not be put into practice? I think that's a big debate. Uh, how do we use genetic information? And do we use it in a way to determine who gets what health resources. I don't know how to answer that. Um, I, I think genetic information can certainly be helpful to inspire people to want to do a better job of self-care and to realize that, yep, I am more vulnerable. Uh, and so, I, for example, the APOE4, I have a, a lot of followers who have APOE4 and know that they're a higher risk for cognitive decline. Uh, and I work with them to say, you may be at higher risk, but there's still all these things we can do to protect your brain, lower your inflammation. And so I have people with two copies of APOE4 would be at a very high risk for early dementia. But in fact, they're still playing chess and doing very well in their 90s. So that use of genetic information to tell people, here's your risk, but there are all these lifestyle factors you could do to mitigate that risk. That's a use that I'm very, very comfortable with. Absolutely. And I think it's the key thing is not to exaggerate the influence of our genetic makeup into what we would be destined to become, because yeah. I don't think there is there is someone that would know the exact split between the environment and the genes. And I think uh, based on the mechanism of action of certain genes and how they actually influence the functions within our cells, I think that's uh, that's something that would need to be looked at on a, on a case by case basis. But would you agree that having that knowledge of what is your baseline is important for people to have? So what I think is a, a big ask for all of us is to give up today's pleasures for tomorrow's benefit. It's enormously difficult. It goes against our biologic wiring. We don't want to give up salt, sugar, fat, uh, pleasure, comfort. It's very hard. If you have the genetic uh, insights to realize that I have more vulnerability in these areas, uh, and so I could reduce that risk with a specific actions, then I may have a much greater willingness to forego today's pleasures and take on these additional activities, tasks, or uh, supplements, uh, or dietary changes to mitigate those risks. And I think that's very empowering. I think that is fabulously empowering. Uh, and so I, I think that can be a very, very helpful tool. And I'm looking for a wide variety of ways that I can help nudge people over the hump to think about what will help them be willing to forego today's pleasures, to improve how their cells can run the chemistry of life to get better health outcomes. And genetic testing certainly is one of the tools that can be very helpful. What other tools people can actually start implementing as, as we get into this post-COVID-19 pandemic that would actually help us become more healthier society? In my practice, some of the things that I help people visualize is what do you want your health for? What is your uh, higher purpose in life? And then to have that clarity. For example, I, I deal with a lot of folks who have severe chronic uh, health issues, disability. They are compromised physically. And so I'm asking them to give up sugar, to give up processed foods, eat more of these radical things known as vegetables, develop new tastes, and begin exercising. And that's work. That takes work. But to help motivate them to do that work, we spend a lot of time on asking them, what do you want your health for? What is uh, the most, if there was a burning building, a burning flat, and if who or what could be in that flat that you care so deeply about it, that you would, be, you would run into that flat to save that person or that item because it matters so much to you. And if then I can help link that person or that thing 
to why they want to improve their health, to why they want to begin that next actionable step, then we have a lot more success at behavior change. Because it, it, it is a, a very big challenge to create new behaviors, to create new taste in what we eat. That, that's a big ask. Absolutely. And I think this is the key word really is having that behavioral change because ultimately if, I don't know if you'd agree with me on this, but do you think that if we were to start implementing any of the things that public health authorities might look into and see that it is needed to maintain a a good health in the society, that those medical advancements must be married up or must be paired up with behavior research? Oh, absolutely. If we don't address the mismatch between our diet, our sleeping pattern, our physical activity, well, our health continues to decline, despite whatever medical advancements we make. Well, uh, health is at the basis, at its basis is our uh, health behavior choices, our, our diet and lifestyle choices. That, we cannot ignore that. And unfortunately, most of the research funding is based on drugs and technology. It's really a tiny, tiny portion is based on understanding health behaviors and understanding why we get uh, sucked down this path uh, of these uh, very destructive dietary and lifestyle patterns. You know, and, and I'll tell you, uh, part of that is that we're very clever as a species. We are very, very clever. We communicate well, uh, and uh, we've gone into business. So we've learned how to make products that meet that biologic desire for sugar, salt, pleasure, uh, inactivity. And so we're surrounded by food products and lifestyle products that meet that biologic craving. But unfortunately, because we don't have the kind of environment that our DNA expects, that leads to this progressively uh, negative feedback on how we can run the chemistry of life and progressive decline of our health, which presently we are compensating for with ever more expensive drugs. And that is not how we're going to become healthy and vibrant. It's something that actually to pose with and to think about, to be honest, because it's very, it is very true and um, quite insightful, definitely. So with regards to actual diets and the people, the way that people actually have implemented some of these changes in their daily lives, do you see us being influenced by this pandemic in order to change our diet in the future? Do you think this pandemic will have that influence on our behavior? Um, I sort of see that people are much more interested in asking the question, what can I do to improve my health? What can I do to improve my immune system's ability to protect me from this virus? So there are a larger number of uh, patients looking for uh, dietary advice, looking for advice on uh, meditation, exercise, integrative medicine, functional medicine. As I hear all of these public service messages about washing your hands, uh, wearing face masks, of course, I wish that they'd also be saying, and by the way, you should also eat your vegetables, get rid of the sugar, uh, sleep uh, more, get outside, get some fresh air, and have these messages for public health. For a wide variety of reasons, our government's not able to do that. Uh, so it's up to people like you and me to keep putting this message out as widely as we can, that yes, we're all going to get the virus. We all will get this virus, and it may be that we have, we're going to get it every year for quite a while but we'll be more likely to have a mild case if we do a great job with our self-care and our health behaviors. And we're more likely to have a more aggressive case that will leave you with a more significant health challenge long-term if you have a, a terrible diet. Absolutely. I think, as you said, diet and lifestyle risk factors are quite a, a big differentiator between, uh, between people who have uh, the, the severe symptoms and the ones that do not. So with genetics, the science might prove in the coming years. Another factor that uh, will play out is the effectiveness of the governments will play out as well mm. in terms of how uh, effective they are at uh, helping protect their public, care for their public, and care for their economies. Uh, so in the next 100 years, we'll see the impact of this, which societies were most effective uh, at maintaining the health of their population. And I, and I don't know how that will turn out yet. How do you see it happening at the moment from what we have seen so far? So wh what I uh, think about is the impact on the education of the children will be huge. So the societies that can figure out how to keep people healthy and to keep educating their young people long term will be the societies that are... Uh, least negatively impacted. And are there any countries that stand out in your opinion on how they have managed this uh, pandemic? 
Well, it looks like the Chinese economy may be the least negatively uh, impacted at this point. Uh, I, I think we'll need another full cycle year or two years to, to fully know. Yeah. Uh, the other challenge is it's hard to know what's true that's coming out of China or not yeah. uh, because they have such a uh, rigid control of their media. So that makes it certainly a bit more difficult. And countries like Sweden, for example, uh, are, are one of those countries that have never opted to actually enforce the lockdown in its full... Correct. Yeah. That may have been uh, a wise choice or, or not have been a wise choice. I don't know. But I think the there's a dual impact of the public health and the impact on the economy and the education of the young children. Uh, it's a complicated circumstance. And you can sort of think of this of the evolutionary forces that are impacting the individual and the society at large. And all of us are going through this enormous stress test right now, us individually and our societies uh, collectively. And we will see uh, which societies, uh, right along with which individuals, do the best. I would like to conclude by asking you a question about, if we were to have a crystal ball right now and you were to look into the future, where would you see, or where would you like to see the world in five years? Well, you know, I'd certainly like to see us uh, eating a lot more vegetables, being outside, and understanding that the more uh, easily we address mismatched diseases by focusing on creating health, as opposed to treating disease, uh, we'd be much further along. Amazing. What I find very, very encouraging, when I first started doing my research uh, using diet and lifestyle uh, in uh, 2010, uh, I literally was the only one doing that uh, in the MS world. Now, there are many more researchers studying the impact of diet quality uh, and many more diets that are being studied, which I think is wonderful news. And there are more researchers that are doing what I do, which is multimodal diet, stress reduction, exercise. And they're studying that for MS, for Alzheimer's, for Parkinson's. So, in fact, we're finally getting uh, some funding and some studies that are beginning to take my approach, which is you create health. And you see what the impact is on quality of life for these disease states. Uh, So it's beginning to happen. And part of the reason that I think we're having success is because of my TED Talk, because of podcasters like yourself, and the public is saying, in increasing numbers, the public is getting this because they're seeing their health transformations and the transformations of their family members. And so the grassroots will help further all of this. So for the internet, for the fact that it can spread, you know, some terrible stuff, it also spreads some wonderful stuff. And I I do see a lot more interest in the uh, movement to create health through, by focusing on diet and lifestyle. So I'm actually very optimistic. We'll we'll lose a lot of folks due to COVID uh, in the pandemics. That has happened throughout all of history. And that will happen throughout all of history going forward. Whenever society gets stressed, you're going to lose uh, a portion of society. I don't know what proportion that will be. And uh, biology will reinforce those who are genetically more fit. And in our case, who are making the best diet and lifestyle choices. It feels to me as if like, it's just going to show or to prove all the work that you have been doing over the past years in terms of showing the impact of, uh, of our diet and lifestyle on our immunity in particular. I mean, I think it's really fa- quite fast, you know, in, in 10 years time to go from being called uh, a lot of negative things, shall we say, in 2010 to, you know, in 2018, getting uh, international awards for uh, uh, my research uh, and increasing recognition in the impact that my work has had on uh, the research in general in uh, the neurological space, because now people are focusing on how do you create health. And there's a lot more focus on diet, exercise, stress reduction, sleep quality. So I'm actually very encouraged. I think good things will happen. Many good things. There is no doubt, no doubt about that. I'm 100% sure that this will be put even more forward uh, over the coming months and years. Would you mind just giving us some overview about the programs that you currently have on your website? Oh, yeah. No, sure. I'd, I'd love to. So for practitioners, we have a certification program um, where we have an online uh, training and that's coupled with in-person, not uh, virtually live case studies 
Uh, and with that, uh, we then have people get to have access to monthly Q&A sessions with me. So that, that's really a great program for practitioners. And we have a live virtual, used to be live in person, but this year we made it live uh, virtual for the public. And that's going on right now. Uh, and that teaches people about uh, the Walls Protocol and all of the things that we can do for our self-care is to create health. Uh, that has just been phenomenally successful. We have hundreds of people every year, many of them from the UK. So that that is uh, wonderful. Uh, we have a new clinical trial that we've got uh, that we're recruiting people for, comparing in the newly diagnosed MS patient and clinically isolated syndrome patient who've been offered drugs and de- but declined them because they want to use diet and lifestyle. We're comparing that cohort to uh, people who have are taking drugs and getting standard of care. And we have information about that study. Uh, I, you have to contact our uh, study team at msdietstudy at healthcare.uiowa.edu. Thank you so much, Dr. Terry. It was an absolute pleasure speaking with you. And uh, we would uh, love to stay connected and hopefully to have you on future podcasts as well. Thank you. Much love to you and your team. Thank you for listening to today's episode of Another Angle. We hope you found some useful information in today's podcast. Feel free to share it with your loved ones. And please do let us know in the comments which areas or topics you would like us to discuss next. We would love to deliver that right knowledge right to you. Stay safe.